From Sarasota Memorial, this is HealthCast. A healthy dose of information from experts you can trust. Hi everyone, welcome to HealthCast. I'm Allison Gottermeyer. Thank you for joining us today as we discuss emergency treatments for common issues we experience right here in Florida, including bug bites, stings, and even burns. Our guest today, Dr. Steve Kamm, an emergency medicine physician right here at Sarasota Memorial. Dr. Kamm, thank you so much for joining us. Nice to be here, thank you. So Dr. Kamm, one of the first things we wanna talk about in Florida is of course, sun emergencies. We see them quite a bit. So many people get sunburns here, but some are more serious than others. When is a sunburn an emergency? Okay, Allison, so you're right. Uh, a lot of people here in Florida spend a lot of time out in the sun. And as long as you protect yourself and wear the right clothing and wear the sunscreen, you should be okay. But if you don't, you can get a pretty bad sunburn. It's pretty unusual that, um, and I can tell you as, as an emergency medicine physician, it's very, very unusual for someone to come into the emergency department with a sunburn. Um, if they do come in, it's because they're in a lot of pain and we can help them with the pain aspect, with pain medication, but there really isn't a whole lot we can do to help the sunburn go away. It's just gonna have to take time and get better on its own. We can help them with their symptoms. So generally, we're not gonna have somebody go to the emergency department because you can stay home and do over-the-counter remedies for the sunburn. Who is most get most at risk for burn emergencies? Well, uh, fair-skinned individuals are more likely to be burnt. Uh, if you already have a good tan, you're not going to get burnt, or if you have a uh, darker colored skin. Uh, but yeah, the fair-skinned, the freckled face individual, they're more likely to get burnt. And here in Sarasota, many elderly people worry about it, especially with thinner skin, babies as well. How are those, how, how do you protect skin that is more at risk? Really the same way that anybody protects their skin, with a protective clothing, with a nice uh, wide-brimmed hat, sunscreen, reapplying it. And probably one of the smartest things is just to try and avoid long periods of time out in the sun in the middle of the day. If you're out in the sun or in the early part of the day or end of the day when the UV rays aren't as bad, then you can you can tolerate it. But if you're out for six hours in the middle of the day, you're gonna to have to be really fastidious about reapplying sunscreen because you're just gonna get a lot of UV exposure. So what should someone do if they fear a family member or friend has more than just a regular sunburn? Well, uh, hydrate them. Make sure they have uh, lots of fluids. You can take anti-inflammatories, Motrin, Advil. Uh, people talk about um, aloe lotion to help them with the skin. Uh, but for the most part, just stay out of the sun, take anti-inflammatories like Advil, drink a lot of fluids. So what would be some of the treatments someone might receive if they did come into the ER with blistering, they fell asleep in the sun or something really bad and they have one of those more rare severe burns. Right, and, and that's a good point. If somebody just has red skin, there's probably not a whole lot we're going to do, but if they have a blistering and a lot of fluid-filled sacs uh, on their skin from their really bad sunburn, we would put an IV into them potentially, give them IV fluids. Um, there is some cream that we use for burns that might come from, say, a house fire or a car fire. It's called silvadine ointment. In some cases, we might apply that to the blistered skin, but generally we're just gonna give them fluids, give them pain medication, and we don't pop the blisters. We don't recommend anybody at home try and stick a needle into it and try and pop the fluid-filled sacs. Just let it uh, get better on its own and it'll eventually uh, drain on its own or dry up. Uh, like I said before, there's not anything, once the damage is done, there's really nothing we can do to accelerate the healing process. Your skin will regenerate on its own time. We can just try and make you a little more comfortable. And of course, every sunburn, even if it's just 
a regular one or not too painful is concerning because it puts you at higher risk of skin cancer, correct? That's correct. And we're realizing now with uh, Florida and all the skin cancers that are being diagnosed in Florida, really all over the country, but particularly in Florida, because we have that exposure to the sun year round, 365 days a year essentially, versus other parts of the country where maybe they're outside half the year, we're outside every day here in Florida. So yes, we're seeing melanomas and squamous cell cancers and basal cells going way up. And we know that that's related to sunburns, not necessarily really that you had yesterday or last week or last month, but the damage that was done when you were younger and didn't really pay attention because you didn't really think about it too much, but then that catches up with you when you're older and you had all those, uh, all that damage to your skin. Yes, later in life, uh, it could lead to increased chance of skin cancer. Now, do we see sunburns that go hand in hand with overheating emergencies? Uh, they can, sure. Uh, somebody can get a real bad sunburn and it's like you said, the person maybe that fell asleep and they're not keeping up with their fluids. So they're not drinking uh, a bottle of water every hour like they should. And so they can uh, coincide with each other where they're dehydrated and sunburned. And so again, it's just important to push fluids, right? Keep drinking fluids. It doesn't necessarily mean just beer. Uh, it can be water, it can be Gatorade. Uh, not saying you can't have an alcoholic beverage, but it's not, you're, you're trying to replenish your sweat, which is a combination of electrolytes and just regular water. So that's what you wanna, you wanna drink. And you should go through a bottle of water every hour. And if you're laying out there all day, all morning, all afternoon, and you haven't had to go to the bathroom even once, that should be kind of a worrisome sign to you that you're falling behind on your fluids. With the Florida heat, it's not just sunburns we worry about. It's not just overheating we worry about. We face bugs year round. And there are some people like myself that are just attractive to mosquitoes. I don't know. So when is a bug bite or a sting considered more severe, something that is an emergent? Most bug bites, the vast majority are gonna be very minor, uh, they're more annoying than anything. They will itch. Uh, they'll give you, you know, an unsightly bump or lump on your face or somewhere on your body where you just uh, don't want to have to deal with it. As far as it being a real emergency, that's very unusual. The two times that it can be somewhat of an emergency, or I would say really is an emergency, is if you have an allergic reaction or what we call an anaphylactic reaction to the bug bite. So for reasons we don't understand, 10 people in a row could be bitten by a fire ant and they're perfectly fine. And then that 11th person, they may not know it at the time, but they get bit and they're having an allergic reaction. The body is mounting a response to the bug bite that's exaggerated and their tongue may swell up. They may get short of breath. Uh, they may pass out. They may start having chest pain. So they're having anaphylactic reaction to the bug bite. So that's one case that again is pretty few and far between that something like that would happen. But if you would notice a bug bite and you're getting some chest pain or shortness of breath, or you, your lips are swelling, your face is swelling, your tongue is swelling, that's something where you wanna to get to the emergency department. Uh, the other less of an emergency that can happen from bug bites would be something would be more of a delayed situation. So maybe a couple days later, maybe you picked at the bug bite, maybe you didn't do anything other than just try to take care of it, but now it's infected and you're starting to get uh, increased redness. Usually the infection won't start up until about two or three days later. So if you see a little redness initially in the first day or so, that's not an infection, it's too soon for infection. That's just more of an inflammatory response. But two or three days later, you get some redness, you may get some streaking, uh, what we call lymphangitic streaking up the arm or up the leg. It looks like a, a, a rope essentially on your arm. Or you may get some swollen lymph nodes, you may get a fever, you may start feeling poorly. Then that's another situation where you should go see your physician, go to one of the urgent cares, possibly the emergency department if it's in the middle of the night and everybody else is closed 
to get treatment with antibiotics. Sometimes IV is what you need if you're really sick from it. Sometimes just oral antibiotics will do the trick. Now back to anaphylaxis, what is the treatment that someone would receive? Because that really can become emergent and, and severe very quickly. Yes, so the major treatment for that would be epinephrine. And that's why those that have a uh, history and they, they know that every time they've been stung by a bee or by a fire ant, they've had an allergic reaction in the past, they're really supposed to be carrying around an EpiPen with them, which is something that they can self-inject. Now, you have to keep it in your purse or keep it with you at all times because you just never know when you're going to get stung or bit again. Um, for anybody else that doesn't have that history, they don't know and they won't have the EpiPen and they just need to call 911 or get to the emergency department because the treatment is, again, epinephrine and you won't be able to go to a Walgreens and get epinephrine. You're going to have to seek a medical professional uh, to get it in the walk-in or urgent care or in the emergency department. Or, like I said, if you have a history of that, then your doctor will prescribe that EpiPen for you. And there's an adult EpiPen and there's a junior EpiPen, as the name applies for children. It's a different dose. For parents who maybe haven't, their, their child hasn't experienced a bee sting or a fire ant bite yet, um, how can they be prepared? What should they look for? Their child has their first bee sting. Mm -hmm. Their child has their first fire ant bite. When is it concerning? When do they need to get to the ER? Right. And just to add to what I said about um, your question about the treatment, so epinephrine, but also antihistamines. So those are things that you can do at home. Benadryl is a classic antihistamine, Zyrtec, Claritin, because uh, that is going to help. The biggest part of the swelling and the redness is the body releasing histamine from the cells. Your, um, so any antihistamine will help with that, will help with the swelling, help with the itching, help with the redness. Uh, but for anyone having a life-threatening reaction, it's much more than antihistamines, it's epinephrine. Now to your question about what should parents look for with their child, if it's just something that's annoying them and just um, painful and itching, you want to just try and tell them not to scratch at it. You can give them some Advil or Motrin. Um, there's really not a whole lot you can do. Like it's the same thing with sunburns. There's no way to accelerate the healing of that bug bite, but you want to make sure the child's not picking at it or clawing at it. That can make it worse. And um, just look for signs of severe allergic reactions. So it would be the child is starting to have some swelling, not necessarily where the bug bite was, but they're seeing swelling around their face or swelling to the neck, swelling to the lips. The parent can tell their child, stick your tongue out and do that early on so you know what is normal. And then an hour later, stick your tongue out. If it seems like it's getting bigger, then oh yes, that's something where you need to go to the emergency department right away. So, and the reason for that is we're looking for anything that might begin to affect the airway. Are they gonna have airway issues uh, where they, things are swelling to where now they can't breathe very well. So that would be what the parents should watch for. Uh, and then, like I said, a couple days later, if it's starting to get red and starting to have streaking going up the arm or streaking going up the leg, or they're getting fevers, or you're seeing pus coming out, then that would be another thing that the parents should watch out for and say, we need to get antibiotics. But I would say probably 99% of bug bites are going to get better on their own with just conservative treatment, soap and water with a washcloth, look for signs of infection. The allergic reaction, if it's going to happen, the bad allergic reaction is going to happen in the first few hours after the bug bite. It's not going to be a bug bite and then a day later their airway is closing off. So it's the bug bite, the first few hours, okay, they're not having any swelling, they're not having any airway issues, we're good there. Um, now we just need to look out for signs of infection. There are some other bites and stings that are maybe a little less common, but we certainly worry about quite a bit in Florida. I'm talking about shark bites during stingray season, stings from, some, from rays, even jellyfish. So 
What do treatments look like for those emergencies and how often are you seeing those come into the ER? Very rarely that we see a shark bite or an alligator bite. Um, anything like that, of course, uh, is not something you're gonna try and treat at home. Uh, you're gonna take them to the emergency department, shark bite, alligator bite. The stingray uh, bite is fairly infrequent, although we're coming into that season here where they're more common in the summer and they'll be in the shallow water in the Gulf, the stingrays. Uh, I can go into the treatment for that uh, in just a bit. The, the jellyfish is very, very unusual around here. And we don't have the really nasty ones that people think about, the Portuguese man of war jellyfish. It just, it's, I've been around for quite a while. I don't think I've ever seen anything like that. We get the smaller jellyfish that will um, sting the arms with their tentacles. You'll swim and you'll come up maybe into a couple jellyfish and uh, you'll get some irritation of the skin. It's not life-threatening. Uh, there's, uh, it can be somewhat painful, but there's really not a whole lot you can do for that. People talk about putting vinegar on it. You hear about all these urban legends about doing this or doing that, but really it's just symptomatic therapy. You shouldn't have to go to the emergency department unless you're having signs of anaphylaxis airway issues, you're having an allergic reaction to the venom and you're having, you know, your lips swelling up, your tongue swelling up. But that's all again, very, very unusual that we get uh, jellyfish um, uh, difficulties around our waters. Fortunately, the stingrays are relatively common. And the thing about the stingray is that you will feel uh, a little mark to your ankle or feel a little pain to the ankle, maybe to the foot, and you'll feel like you stepped on something. But within about a minute, you'll know that this is something very unusual because you will have the most excruciating pain and it's been described as uh, childbirth-like or broken bone uh, in, as far as intensity. And grown men will get down on their hands and knees and beg and cry from just severe pain uh, and the treatment for that is get their foot into hot water. And it denaturalizes, destabilizes the enzyme that's injected into your foot. It breaks it down, essentially. So there's the problem, there's the rub, right? You're, in the, uh, you're on Lido Beach, how quickly can you get to hot water when you're uh, there in the Gulf? But the quicker you can get into the hot water, put your foot in the hot water, the quicker you will have relief. You put your, hot wa your foot into the hot water and uh, leave it there for 10 or 15 minutes. You take your foot out and the pain comes back. You gotta put your foot back in the hot water. You need someone to replenish the hot water. The lifeguards there typically know what to do. They've, they come across that all the time and they have a supply of hot water. And uh, if you go up to any of the lifeguards, they'll be able to point you in the right direction. But that's, that's the treatment and it's really a miraculous treatment for stingray envenomations. It will take away the pain. And then after a couple, maybe it's an hour, you take your foot of, out of the hot water and the pain doesn't come back, then you're done. Now, what about the barbs that sometimes are left behind? How are those removed or, or should people come to a physician to get them removed? It's uh, very unusual that a barb is left behind. People will see the bloody wound on their foot or their ankle and you will assume that there's a barb there or they think that there is a barb there, 19 times out of 20, there is no barb that's left behind. Uh, we talked about how you would take care of the pain uh, with the hot water. You can go to your physician and you can get an x-ray. The barb may or may not show up on the, uh, on the x-ray. Generally though, we just uh, assume that there is no barb. The only way to really know for sure, you could do an ultrasound, that will help. If you're seeing the physician, they can do an ultrasound of that area and look for the foreign body. We could locally explore, and we have done that in the past, uh, to look for barbs if we think there's one left behind. But more often than not, you're just causing more damage than harm when you start to cut into somebody's foot looking for a barb. And we just basically tell the individual, it's most likely not there, just treat it as you would any wound 
but if it starts to get infected down the line, we need to go back and rethink this and maybe locally explore it and see if there is a barb that's left behind that's causing the problems. If someone thinks they've witnessed a shark bite, a stingray sting, what should they do? Does, the person doesn't always need to go to the ER. You talked about getting the foot in hot water, things like that. But obviously with something more severe, a shark bite, an alligator bite, calling 911 is, is the only treatment, right? I would think so. Uh, I, and I guess there is such a thing as a minor shark bite or a minor alligator bite, but uh, they're going to be doing some pretty significant tissue damage um, from the bite, the shark and the alligator. So to be evaluated and probably get a dose of IV antibiotics, there would be a high incidence of infection. Again, these things are relatively rare, so there's not a really good track record of what does work and what doesn't work other than we would tend to be conservative, clean the wound out really well, probably give them a dose of antibiotics, uh, do an x-ray to see if there's any shark teeth left behind or alligator teeth left behind. Most of them are, if, if it happens, they're gonna be pretty significant where they need to come in, they need to probably go to the operating room and get everything washed out. They're gonna need a fair amount of suturing done, which we may not be able to do all of that in the emergency department. If it's a couple sutures, fine, but they may need something more involved and have to go to the operating room. How do you advise people to enjoy all the beautiful, great outdoors that Florida has to offer safely? Well, just all the things that we've talked about so far, uh, Allison, it'd be uh, protect yourself, uh, wear the sunscreen, drink a lot of fluids, and wear the right clothing. Try, if you can, to avoid six hours of being out in the middle of the day in Florida every day. If you do that every now and then, that's fine, but try and go maybe in the early morning hours, later in the day if you like to go out every day so that you avoid that maximum, maximum UV intensity. As far as bugs, I mean, that's just part of living in Florida. You can't avoid all the bugs. All of our bugs, it seem like they bite here in Florida. And uh, there's really no way to avoid that. You can try bug spray that will help to some degree. And um, you could certainly uh, pick up some spray to help against uh, mosquito bites and, uh, and those sorts of things. But other bites like fire ant bites, you try and watch where you're walking so that you're not walking through a big ant hill, uh, especially if you have sandals on. Pay attention, look, if you're walking across a grassy field, maybe littered with fire ant bites. And as far as alligator bites, I mean, it's one of those things where every pond in Florida has a gator in it until proven otherwise. So if you're standing on the edge of a pond fishing, uh, you need to be very careful. There could be a gator in there. You need to watch out. The sharks, there's really nothing you can do. You, if you're out there in the water, it, it could happen. Uh, but it's fortunately very, very infrequent. And I would say it's common sense that if you're bleeding or for any reason, uh, you don't want to be in the water. Uh, that's going to attract uh, all sorts of different creatures, whether it be sharks or alligators. Dr. Steve Kahn, thank you so much for joining us for this discussion today. And as a reminder, we do live in sunny and beautiful Florida. It's important that we enjoy our surroundings, but do so safely. And as always, we encourage everyone in our community to visit smh.com to get the latest information from Sarasota Memorial. Have a great day.